So, as I mentioned, my name is Carolyn Hatch. I'm a postdoc fellow here at the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development at Michigan State University. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, Responding to an SOS from the Commercial Beekeeping Industry. And if our audience numbers are any indication, this is most certainly a topic that's really germane today, um, given the significant role that bees play in our food supply and food security. On the one hand, uh, bees are said to impact one in three bites that we take every day. Um, and on the other hand, this extremely worrisome decline that we see in bee populations. So here to talk about this is Dr. Marla Spivak, who is a MacArthur Fellow and the McKnight Distinguished Professor in Entomology at the University of Minnesota. Marla has bred a line of honeybees called the Minnesota, Minnesota Hygienic Line to defend them against diseases and parasitic mites. And this presentation is part of our Innovations in Agriculture and, and Rural Development webinar series here at the, at the Center. The goal of this series is to connect the innovative ideas and the, the research that's being conducted by land by land grant university scientists. OK, excuse me for one second. I'm seeing a, a message here that my sound quality is not very good. I apologize. Rosa, can you um, can you put your yeah, Carolyn. can you give me some feedback on the quality of my sound, please? Yeah, it is just a little muffled. I don't know if you want to um, go ahead and turn your volume down just a bit, or maybe move your mic away a little. Okay, if that helps any. I apologize. Does that work? Is that any better? That works better. Okay. Yes. OK, terrific. All right, my apologies to everyone. Um, terrific, thanks, Melville <laughs> and others. That, that's, that's great. OK, so as I mentioned, this presentation is part of our Innovations in Agriculture and Rural Development webinar series here at the Center. And that the goal of this series is to connect the ideas and the innovative research that's being conducted by land-grant university scientists in the North Central region with stakeholders and communities in rural areas. So before we proceed, I just wanted to point out a couple of administrative items. Um, Marla is going to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. And if you have questions for our speaker, please put them directly into the Q&A box. Um, given the large audience numbers that we're expecting today, R my colleague Rosa and I are going to attempt to filter the questions for you know, repetition, redundancy, that kind of thing. And Marla's going to address the questions at the end of her talk. And we're going to do our very best to get through as many as possible. So just, just bear with us. Um, so, we're really pleased to host and welcome Professor Marla Spivak. And today, Marla is going to talk about the B Tech Transfer Program that she and colleagues are involved with to increase efforts to keep bee populations healthy. So Marla, a very warm welcome. Thanks for being, for being with us today. And I would like to uh, turn it over to you. All right, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if it's still morning. Can everybody hear me? I'm going to assume so until somebody interrupts somehow. <laughs> so I'm also going to thank you for everybody for being here. Uh, I'm going to assume that everybody understands that bees are in trouble, both our honeybees and our native bees. And today I'm going to speak about solutions, how we're responding to at least the honeybee part of the problem. Everybody knows, I think, uh, that there, on average, every winter, about 30% of all of our colonies, honeybee colonies across the United States, die. So this is a management survey taken by the Bee Informed Partnership. And I be, I'll be speaking quite a bit about Bee Informed as we go. These are survey results from you, beekeepers. And they show that 
we're way over the acceptable range. If beekeepers say they're they're willing to uh, have a 15% loss over the winter, this shows that we're at least double that. And this includes our commercial beekeepers, migratory beekeepers, and our backyard beekeepers. I want to put in a little bit, two slides to show what we're doing for backyard beekeepers, at least at the University of Minnesota. This is our Bee Lab webpage. And within the Bee Lab, we've started a program called the Bee Squad. And it's help for backyard beekeepers only at this point in the Twin Cities area. So we provide uh, hands on mentoring. We are the beekeepers for some people. Um, we have mentoring apiaries where people can come in and get help with their beekeeping problems. And what we found is that our customers because there is a fee for this, become amazing bee, ab bee ambassadors. They not only keep bees or we keep the bees for them, but they're starting to plant a lot of flowers for bees. They're really starting to pay attention to pesticide use around where their colonies are, and they're paying a lot of attention to our native bees. So this is a program that possibly could be extended to other land-grant universities, and maybe I'll give another webinar on that sometime. But today I want to talk about tech transfer bee teams, how we're helping commercial beekeepers. And this is being funded and done through the Bee Inform partnership right now. But I'd like to give you a little bit of history where this idea came from and what's going on with it right now. So that's what I'm going to focus on in this talk is this tech team idea. And it began, actually, uh, it had roots way back in 1994 when Gary Reuter and I, my technician at the University of Minnesota, started breeding bees for hygienic behavior. This is a behavior, it's a behavioral defense that bees, honeybees use against uh, AFB, which is an acronym for American Fowl Brood, a disease of honeybees, Chalk Brood, another disease, and Varroa mites. And the bees are able to detect and remove the disease or mite infested brood from the nest. And so they're able to limit disease transmission and mite reproductive success. So it's quite an important behavior. And the assay for it is quite simple. I have to go into this little bit of detail just for the background, so if you'll bear with me. The assay that we've developed, one way to do this is to pour liquid nitrogen down a PVC pipe or tube, and you freeze uh, pupae right in the comb. You put the frame with the frozen pupae back into the colony. You check it at 24 hours, and the amount of freeze-killed or dead brood that the bees remove in 24 hours is correlated with how quickly they will detect and remove disease brood and mite-infested brood. And so on the right you see a photo of a happy beekeeper who after 24 hours took out his brood frame and this patch right here, if you can see that circle in the middle, is the freeze-killed brood that was completely removed within 24 hours. So that's the assay. At the university, we bred a line of bees for hygienic behavior. That's where the Minnesota hygienic line came. And I did this through instrumental insemination. So I would raise queens from many different sublines that we were maintaining at the university and collect semen from other colonies and inseminate the queens. The lines don't need to be bred through insemination, but this is what I did. And we had three goals in selecting bees for hygienic behavior. The first, was to test neural mechanisms underlying the behavior. How do they detect the disease brood? And we poked and prodded bees. Uh, we pulled out their brains, which is this uh, photo at the bottom. That's a bee brain. We paint marked bees and observed their behaviors very carefully and had a whole uh, lot of publications on the basis, the mechanisms of this behavior. The second goal was to test the hygienic colonies in commercial beekeeping apiaries to see if they produced honey. So for example, when you're doing breeding, it's important that the bees are still good bees. If honey production is a priority, then we needed to test to make sure the line was still producing honey. If they have less disease, if they had lower mite loads compared to unselected stock. And so for many years, we had a whole slew of publications on uh, comparing the hygienic line to other stock. 
And the third goal was to encourage commercial beekeepers to select for this behavior, this hygienic behavior, from among their own genetically diverse stocks. And this was more of an extension component to all this research. So we can breed lines in a university and we can test the mechanisms and we can test them in commercial beekeeping apiaries. But I really did not want to be breeding the line forever. And in fact, uh, I didn't want to continue breeding the line because I think we need genetic diversity in our U.S. colonies, in our U.S. stocks, and I didn't want a, a lot of people using bees from the Minnesota hygienic line or from one stock. We'd been working very carefully with uh, beekeepers from Minnesota that raised queens, but the only success that we had in promoting other bee breeders and queen producers to select for this trait were those that we were working with directly in a, in a hands-on, one-on-one one, one -on -one way. So I'm going to make this story very short because I want to make sure we have a lot of time for questions. I looked at this map that Steve Shepard, Dr. Shepard from Washington State University produced, and it showed where the commercial queen producers are in Northern California and they're grouped together and there's about 20, there may be more, and they produce quite a number of queen bees for sale across the United States. And of course there is other bee breeders in the southeast scattered, but I looked at this conglomeration or this grouping of bee breeders in Northern California and I wondered why or why they weren't selecting for hygienic behavior and what was the obstacle and how I could help them do this because there's a huge potential impact on the genetics in the United States. If I could get this initially, this group of bee breeders to select for this trait, maybe we could spread the trait across the United States and improve the genetics within the United States. So I spent quite a bit of time in California um, talking to the queen producers and learning what they do, how they do it. And I've said this many times, they're very, they're excellent, excellent queen producers, but they needed some more technical assistance that they just couldn't add on themselves. About this time, Dennis Van Engelstorp was working separately, and he came up with this brilliant idea to write a grant to USDA NEFA um, to create a bee-informed partnership. And he was able to get a lot of funding, $5 million worth of funding from the USDA to start this Be Informed partnership. And the idea was to use beekeepers' real-world experience to solve their real-world problems. And now he and Karen Rennick, they're at the University of Maryland, are running this program expertly and it's multifaceted. I encourage everybody to go to this website, mostly because the survey data that I showed on that second slide of the 30% average losses, that's, they get the information from the beekeepers. So I was glad to hear or see through the survey that there's so many beekeepers participating in this webinar and that I hope everybody has gone online to the Bee Informed website and participated in that survey. And actually I would like to know there will be another survey you can take uh, maybe when the talk is done, how many of you have taken this survey, and if you haven't, I hope that you do, because this is super important that we get this information. Ah, there's the survey. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'll wait one second here. All right, so you 60% approximately that haven't done the survey, you know you have homework tonight. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go on. Thanks. So we started, I spoke with Dennis. He was writing this big grant, and I said I would, if possible, I would like to add a component to the grant to help the bee breeders. And so we merged ideas and I'm today just going to be speaking about the tech team portion of the Be Informed Partnership uh, project. It's a huge project, multi-layered with many surveys, and I'm only talking about one of them, which is the tech team help. Our short-term goals are just to provide 
beekeepers with useful information about their colonies. The long-term goal, which is the same for the Bee Informed Partnership, is to reduce overall colony losses by using data to best develop management practices for different regions. So our whole goal is to reduce colony losses in the United States. For the tech team, the specific objectives are to monitor colonies for diseases and pests to help the commercial beekeepers do this, especially the bee, well, bee, commercial beekeepers, as you'll see, and bee breeders, to select for traits that will improve bee health and genetic diversity, such as hygienic behavior, and to conduct small-scale experiments and to facilitate cooperative research. Right now, because of the excellent funding and then from input from other sources from funding, we've been able to start tech teams in Northern California with the queen breeders, the upper Midwest, specifically Minnesota and North Dakota. And that tech team, tech team works with migratory beekeepers that move their bees from North Dakota to California for almond pollination or for, for from North Dakota and Minnesota down south to Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi to raise queens. They're honey producers, they're queen breeders, they do a lot of different things. We were able to start a new tech team uh, from Florida and Georgia, actually, and it runs to Southern California following migratory pollinators and queen and a few queen breeders from the southeast. That one's very new. We're just starting up and hoping for a lot more participation. We have a tech team in Hawaii that works with queen breeders there and one that we just just starting in Oregon mostly to work with the many beekeepers there who run their bees for pollination services in Oregon and they also go down to California for almond pollination. The tech team members, I was scrambling this morning looking for photos for, for all of them and then I realized well once they put their bee veils on they kind of all look the same. <laughs> so I'll just tell you who they are. For the Upper Midwest team, Katie Lee runs it and she has expert help from others throughout the year but she's the one that comes is, works in Minnesota and North Dakota and follows beekeepers to California or south to Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Rob Snyder and Ben Salman are working in Northern California. Liana Teagan is working Florida, Georgia, and then she goes to Southern California. Ellen Topitzhofer is our new person from Oregon, and Danielle Downey is in Hawaii. And thank you, I think some of you guys are listening. I really thank you for all your efforts. What they do, they do this in a very standardized way. They visit beekeepers, the participating beekeepers, and they record all kinds of information. So they're recording yard information, the where the colonies are, the GPS um, location, the weather, and then lots of information from the colony itself, the strength of the colony, the queen, any sign of disease, how the brood pattern is, and any other notes. And then they take samples. So they take samples in alcohol, for Varroa mites and Nozema. These are sent immediately to the University of Maryland lab where they have a whole crew of people who go through these samples in a very standardized way and a very quick way to determine how many mites per uh, sample for 300 bees, how, what the Nozema load is like. Another sample is sent on dry ice to Dave Tarpey's lab at, in, at North Carolina State University where they with very laborious methods go through and look at virus loads within that sample. They can and they and we hope to do this more in the future sample for pesticides. This is an extremely expensive analysis where you collect a sample of bees or pollen or nectar whatever your uh, whatever you'd like to test, you send it to a USDA lab in, in North Carolina. In the future, we hope to come up with tests for protein, and for some beekeepers, they do the hygienic behavior test. And that would be, especially for the bee breeders, where they're testing a pool or a collection of potential breeder colonies for disease resistance trait, hygienic behavior, and for other diseases and pests, in a way so that the bee breeders could then have a lot of information on their colonies and then select for their breeder colonies, those that they're raising queens from, from, from this pool of already surveyed and monitored colonies. The important part of this program is that the beekeepers get the feedback within 10 days and it's all anonymous. So they know who they are. This is a report, part, part of a report given to one beekeeper and you can see the, the rows in white. Uh, the bottom row shows the bee 
this particular hive one was sampled at the end of Jan uh, that would be June and then again in August and then apparently there was a treatment put on they sampled again to see if the treatment was effective in September and you can see the number of mites on the right hand columns and then the nosema spores per million bees and any other comments and they did this for colony two and it will continue down to 50 or however many colonies they sampled per beekeeper. The tech teams then compile the data and give reports, but they're all coded. So no beekeeper knows, or other beekeepers don't know who the other beekeeper's code is. Beekeeper L, for example, would know that he or she, those are his or her mite loads, but nobody knows who L is because every time they give these reports, all of the results are scrambled. And so we're, we're able to keep track. This is just one sample from August, but we have all of this data from uh, when it began in 2011. This is an example of some hygienic test results where the bar in blue tells the average level of hygienic behavior from colonies that were tested from bee breeders in California in 2011. And then how much it's increased, the red horizontal line shows how much it has increased into 2014. So they're making continual progress. Um, some beekeepers, lots of progress. Look at beekeeper six. And some were already very hygienic already in 2011, and so they just need to maintain this level. So this is really hopeful for me that we can really get this trait into the U.S. populations. And we'll, we're starting to do this now, of course, with the bee breeders in Georgia and Florida, and, um, and certainly the ones that are from the upper Midwest. I want to give one example of how the tech teams then can interact with co collaborative and cooperative research. As this was an example from 2011 where bee breeders in California thought that pristine, which is a fungicide that they were applying at the time of almond bloom, was affecting their queen bee development. So they sent out a cry for help to the tech team that was in California and they ran, it was Katie Lee actually ran a few tests and then called in, <laughs> the big guns called in um, Dr. Johnson from Ohio State, Reed Johnson, to run some more specific studies. And after a couple years of studies, he found that in fact it wasn't the pristine fungicide that was affecting the queens directly, it was additives that they were putting in a tank mix that was applied at the time of the fungicide where they were adding some insect growth regulator, which is on the bottom line there, which I'll never pronounce this, this insect growth regulator, and some other insecticides that were killing, uh, affecting the queen bee development. And so this was because the tech team was out there on the ground working with the beekeepers. They heard their, they heard their cry for help and they responded by calling a researcher who then was able to get to the bottom of the problem. So the benefit of this to the beekeepers is that they have experts and they're independent people. They're not really affiliated with um, a university per se. Some are at universities, but they're really independently trained and operating people. They're not government people. They're not regulatory people. They sample and analyze the samples. They perform the hygienic testing and they keep records. And they get the report back in time to, make, to the beekeepers very quickly so that the beekeepers can make treatment decisions and select their breeder stock. They're able to anonymously look at these reports and compare how they are, how their disease and mite levels and virus levels compare among the beekeepers in their region. And this puts a little competition, a little fire under the bellies of many of them to, uh oh, I better clean up my act or I, what can I learn, what can I do better to develop best management practices. Recently, I got feedback from a queen producer in Northern California and the, there were two people, and I've kind of combined comments. Their bees are as healthy as they've ever been. And I'll just let the audience read through this, but it's routine now to have potential breeders tested for hygienic behavior. And um, this is how these this queen producer selects queens and using the information that the tech team gives and their own information and records, they decide who will be their breeders. And this is an example 
of that particular queen producer saying the queens are consistently laying out wood to wood brood, beautiful brood patterns, and thanking for the information that helps write the mate, right management decisions. So the the program, I think, is extremely successful for the beekeepers that are participating. For beekeepers that are not participating, they can get lots of information on the Be Informed website. Um, the Be Informed people can send kits so that you beekeepers can sample their own colonies for Varroa, Nozema viruses, and even pesticides. Um, you can do your own disease monitoring if you don't want to have a tech, person, person, tech team person out there. You can monitor your own colonies and all of these instructions are on the website and uh, Karen Rennick and others can help. And I, I'm going to stop with this. We're looking for long-term funding for this program. Right now, a lot of it is funded from a grant from the USDA NEFA. We have other funds from uh, Costco. We have funds, I'll show you on the last page, from Project Apis Mellifera, from North Dakota Beekeepers, from the Almond Board. There have uh, been lots of people and organizations super interested in this project, but we have to figure out how we're going to fund this long term. We are um, asking for fees for beekeepers, but my question to you, which is the very last survey, is how should we fund this, fund this project? Should it be fees from participating beekeepers? Should we try to get government support, commodity support? Should we ask for support from big ag? <laughs> I'm sure many of my listeners will love this. Should we ask for a combination of, of <laughs> funding from Monsanto or Bayer or Syngenta? That's not one of your options, but you could email it in. And so this is, it looks like people think we need combinations of the above. And I agree. And in fact, people are saying, well, I don't want to analyze the results till they're in. <laughs> Interesting. It's very interesting. And so what I'm curious about, it, I agree that the participating beekeepers should not have to bear the brunt of the, all of the financial burden of this, but I'm also curious how we go about doing a combination of government support and commodity support. And so I think um, this is on behind the survey now. You can see where all of our funding has coming from. And so what I'd like to spend the rest of the time is at letting people ask questions and then um, hoping that you'll provide some input into how we get this funding to continue this program and how we can expand it across the United States and what other programming people might like to have. So thank you very much. Thanks, Marla. That was fascinating. Um, Rosa is going to publicize the short list of questions that we already have. Um, and how is my, uh, Marla, how do I sound right now? Is it okay? You, s you sound great, Carolyn. Thanks. <laughs> Should I mute? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. So we're just uh, organizing our questions. We have a few, but I do encourage anyone who has questions to please put them in the Q&A box. Um, one of the one one question we already had was, will the slides be available? Indeed, the slides will be available because via the recorded webinar, which is going to be available on the NCRCRD website in about 24 hours or so. And I'm going to ask my colleague. Uh, Rosa, if she can post that link. Um, and right now, uh, let's see, we're working to get the, I'm also, another suggestion was that uh, somebody wanted to see the survey again. So I'm going to bring the survey in. There we go. For any, for any um, beekeepers who haven't had a chance to do that. All right. So Rosa, are you able to publicize these questions? No, I, I can't get it to um, publicize. Um, okay. Okay. So it, while you're working on that, I'm going to go ahead. Now, Marla, do you see these questions? 
uh, I don't see any questions. I see the surveys. Okay. The first question is from Peter Borst, and he asks, do you think the magnitude of the problem is unprecedented, given the large-scale die-offs that have occurred over the past 150 years? Hi, Peter. The large-scale die-offs that have occurred in previous years, um, historically, did not last this long. So yes, I think this is unprecedented. Uh, the next question is, is the loss of data for 2013-2014 available yet? Uh, no, because that's what the survey, as I believe, that's what we need people to take the survey so that we can get the, this winter loss data up and out there to everybody because we're so curious. I know it was a really extreme winter here, but from word of mouth and just what we have at the university, it looks like another third loss for us anyway in Minnesota. Okay. Um, Carmen wants you to provide some insight in the impacts that temperature increases and CO2 increases in the atmosphere impact, how they impact the quality of the pollen and the nectar. Um, she says, I understand that these factors uh, decrease protein profiles in pollen and temp in increases support greater evaporation in nectar. Wow. I. I have to say I don't know much about this. It seems like a great area of research. So uh, the person that asked the question, maybe they could email me some information on that. Looks like something we could look into. I'm not sure I can, but somebody might. Thanks. OK. Question from Larry. The vario mite kills colonies. Why has a genetic cure by gene control not been developed? Uh, so the question is, how many colonies are dying from Varroa mites, and why don't we have a genetic treatment for? They're working on um, RNAi, which is silencing of some genes. I don't know how far away that will be. Most of that right now is for treatments for viruses or nosema. I don't know that there will be a genetic solution to the mite problem. I would like there to be a disease or some kind of virus of the mite itself that didn't affect the bee. But mm, it's not going to happen in the next several years, at least through my lens. Thanks, Marla. April wants to, she wants to know where you find the survey at the beinformed.com website. Is it hard to find? Uh, it shouldn't be. I think if you click the button that says participate now, you'll be there. It's a little yellow okay. set sign right on the front, on the home page of the website. Okay. Don says, it seems to me that the SOS is about fungicide IGR use in the almond field last February. How can we get EPA action moving to correct labels? Well, let me back up a little bit. This is a big question. So the SOS is not just about pesticide use. The SOS is because too many colonies are dying and dying from many, many reasons. So the diseases and mites and you know viruses, all these problems that bees have are, are very severe and they beekeepers need help dealing with this. They need help dealing with the genetics of their stock. They need help getting flowers, habitat on the ground so bees have good nutrition. And then they also, we need increased awareness about pesticide effects. So then the next part of the question was, well, how do we, how do we get EPA to move to action? The EPA is really paying attention. They are paying attention to the bee losses. There's lots of legislation happening. Well, there's a lot in Minnesota. I wish you all, well, I don't wish you all lived in Minnesota, but you would be impressed with all the legislative initiatives going on in Minnesota right now to protect pollinators, um, including some pesticide habitat, a pesticide uh, regula regulation. But I think this is happening nationwide. I know that I've been invited to Washington, D.C. next week because there will be a group of people going to the White House to talk about our needs for pollinators. So beekeep bees and beekeepers' voices are being heard right now. I, movement's afloat. We're, it's good. Marla, do you see those list of questions I just made public? Yes, I do. All right. Would you mind working down through those at your own pace? OK. From Peggy for Backyard Beekeepers, um, what do I recommend for Varroa mite treatment? Um, 
I do think, I, I'm going to take some flack for this, but I do think at this point of our, with our stocks in the United States, it's important to monitor your mite levels and treat it in late summer, early fall, and I would use an organic treatment. Um, so anything with thymol, apigard, or formic acid, anything that's an organic treatment, possibly hopgard, which is not organic. It has some synthetic additives. But those kind of treatments would really help keep the mite levels down. And next question, could high loss levels be partially due to the influx of new beekeepers? Well, if you look at the survey results, it does show that the backyard beekeepers, especially if you include the full year, not just the winter losses, the losses are about equal. But it does look like new beekeepers, backyard, backyard beekeepers, do tend to lose a lot of colonies. But this is a learning curve. Um, there's a lot of new beekeepers. So I think, I think that won't be a long-term loss. Beekeepers will figure this out. I don't under have I studied Jeff Pettis? Uh, no, thank you, but I know of his work very well. <laughs> I hope you guys are laughing. I'm going to go down to the next question. Oh, his research on GMO crops causing die offs. Well, what I know, and I don't know that Jeff Pettis did this work, is that the GMO is really not responsible for the die-offs. The BT corn does not affect honeybees directly. The Roundup Ready crops, as far as we know, the herbicide-resistant gene doesn't affect the bees, but what it does is allow us to apply a lot of herbicide everywhere, which kills off flowering plants, which then limit the amount of good, clean food that bees have floral food that they have. Uh, the new paper about the Kenyan bees in the absence of pesticides. Well, this, um, so what this is, and this happened in South America also, as varroa mites move into an area, um, in many locations of the world, the beekeepers uh, never really looked much at their bees or had enough money to purchase treatments for their bees. The beekeeping wasn't developed that much. And so as Varroa came into a country, they lost a lot of bees, up to 80% of all the colonies. And then the colonies would, remaining would develop resistance to the mites. And so yes, it's very exciting, except uh, as a solution in the United States, the trade-off would be if we let 80 or, or so percent of the bees in the United States die off, I guess we wouldn't have fruits and vegetables for about 10 years, because there wouldn't be enough bees to do all the pollination that we need. How can state and local associations best assist your work? Hi, Erin. The best, <laughs> the best way is, uh, as many do already, is to is to help with funds for bee research. Um, there's many things that local associations can do at their universities. The Minnesota Hobby Beekeepers come and help us scrape and paint equipment every spring and get things ready. So there's even you know volunteer work that can be done just with the equipment. But mostly it's funding for bee research and getting the word out as ambassadors to the public to really support bees, to protect bees from pesticides, and to plant a lot of flowers. Where can I get Minnesota Hygienic Queens? Um, I think on our website we have some sources, our website blab.umn.edu. And we're not breeding Minnesota Hygienic Queens. So at this point, with the queen producers throughout the US that are selecting, I would say just get hygienic queens as you can. And this is um, consumer driven movement. So if you ask for hygienic queens, no matter what source, you're going to start getting them. And the tech teams will be um, monitoring them so we can really tell how hygienic they are. How much has the loss of feral bees since the late 80s affected our genetic diversity? This is a study that Steve Shepard has been doing for many years. And I don't have the exact data in front of me, but we have lost some genetic diversity. And on the other hand, there's been an influx of new genes from other places. And he is he has a program at Washington State to import semen 
under quarantine from other countries, and so they're increasing genetic variation. So genetic diversity is extremely important, but I don't think that's our main problem. Um, I assume Mike's question about do we sell and ship queens, that's Minnesota. I'm not at Michigan, I'm in Minnesota. Um, no, we don't sell and ship queens. Sorry, you have to get them from the commercial bee breeders now. How can you help, Lisa? Just spread the word. Um, if you plant bee-friendly flowers, if you pay attention to your pesticide use, if you just be educated about the needs of bees, this is would be a huge help and very much appreciated. Do I believe that pesticides have a part in colony die-off? I believe they have a part. Um, pesticides have been killing bees for a very long time, different pesticide sprays at different times. Um, is it the sole reason for the die-off? I don't think so. Um, chronic exposure to even low-dose pesticides, insecticides, I think, can take a toll on bees. We're just learning the effects of chronic exposure to fungicides, and we haven't really even looked very much at the effect of herbicides on bees. They shouldn't affect them, but but maybe we should look. Another area we haven't really looked is in our water. What are the bees drinking? What kind of runoff are they drinking? So I don't say we can, I don't think we can say pesticides are the sole cause of colony die-offs, but they are contributing and how much I really can't say right now. Poly farmers have less pollinator strips. Yeah, farmers are growing a lot of corn and soybeans and monocrops. And one area of study that really needs to get done that some, bee research, some researchers here at the University of Minnesota are very interested in, they would like to plant cover crops, perennial cover crops, within corn and soybean fields. And they could flower, like clover or other cover crops that might flower. But we need to know the residue in the soil from the seed-treated corn and the, and the treated uh, soybeans. Because if you put in a cover crop in the middle of that field, you need to make sure that the flowers, when they bloom, are clean. We have lots of research to do on pesticide residue in our soil, in our water, and in our flowering plants. Can I suggest any educational resources to aid beekeepers in learning? Boy, there's a lot of good books out there. I think if you go to our website or any bookstore, there's so many great books on, on uh, bees and beekeeping. Wow, could I suggest any specific stuff? Well, OK, go to our website, beelab.umn.edu. That was a shameless plug. <laughs> Microscopy, including pollen samples, that's an area of study in my lab right now. Um, there's not a whole lot of information on how, how to identify pollen samples. So one thing I'm really interested in doing is uh, we're starting it locally, but uh, hopefully we'll get a reference collection or in a library of pollens so that we have a way to identify all the different kind of pollens the bees bring in. What progress has been made in fundraising for your new facility? Thank you for asking that, Larry. It's getting super exciting. The University of Minnesota has put in the capital request to our state legislature uh, a request for funding for the Bee Lab. It's part of a three-pronged project. It'll include two other projects. And if the bundle of projects are funded, I will get a new Bee Lab this year. It's something desperately needed. So. Anybody that lives in Minnesota, if you're listening to this, please call your state representatives and senators. It's getting super exciting. Which pesticides or insecticides should we avoid the most? The way I would phrase that question is I think you just pay attention to the ones you need. First, you, to the ones you use. So that you have to think twice. You have to ask yourself, as a home grower, a home gardener, for example, do I need to apply? anything, an insecticide or an herbicide even? Do I need to apply this? And if I absolutely feel I need to, then what can I apply that will do the least harm for pollinators and beneficial insects? And how could I apply, if, and how could I apply this, this um, 
formulation or this insecticide in a way that it wouldn't cause harm to bees. So for example, spray at night, um, avoid drift onto flowering plants. And for farmers, it's the same set of questions. Do I need to apply this? Do, if I do, what can I apply? Is there risk of contaminating bees? So I'm not against protecting a crop. I'm not against using a pesticide. But I do think we need to pay very careful attention about our use of these insecticides. I, I think in general, we're, this is an understatement, we've gotten a little out of control with our uh, with our treatments, we're a little trigger happy, and we need to be thinking very carefully before we apply them so that we're not uh, harming our beneficial insects and pollinators. I knew these questions, the neonic questions, would show up, and here we go. Thanks, Erin. Are neonics as evil as the current press is making them out to be? Um, you know, the neonics can be evil. High enough dose, they're toxic to to all insects. That's what they're designed to do. In low doses, they can have sublethal effects. And we know this. <laughs> so what we don't know is how much bees are actually exposed to. We know how much residue is in, if you plant one seed, how much residue comes out into the nectar and pollen of that flower. But we don't know how much the bees are exposed to when you plant that same seed, corn on corn or canola on canola, year after year after year. We don't know the bioaccumulation in the soil. We don't know the run runoff of secondary compounds, metabolites into water. We really do not know the exact exposure to bees. And until we do more residue testing, I say the jury's out on how evil it is, but we do know that it can be, as any insecticide can be evil. I hope that answered that question. Uh, in Iowa, losses have been up to 50-60%. We really don't have enough data to um, to understand, to know what our losses are. We really need everybody to take that be informed survey so that we can get state by state, region by region uh, data and know what our average losses are. The weather was, uh, a, it was very severe weather, but in Minnesota, for example, we're very accustomed to long, hard winters. And so we make sure our bees, if we leave them here for the winter, they have 75 to 100 pounds of honey on them, huge clusters and slightly wrapped with an upper entrance and a way to wick mo moisture. So I think if beekeepers further south didn't really prepare their bees for a big winter, if they didn't have enough honey on them, if certainly if they didn't control their mite levels, they would have uh, had higher than 30% loss. You know, small hive beetles, I'm so happy to say we don't have the problem of small hive beetles here. So I, I should be paying attention what the control measures are, but I'm blissfully ignorant. And so I think you need to go to the, <laughs> get information from Georgia and South, South Carolina, North Carolina and Florida where the problem's a big one. Sorry, Deborah. Okay, I did it. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Here we go, one moment. We're getting some more in from Aaron. Um, how long neonics remain in the soil? It depends. It completely depends. And this is where we need lots of information. If the organic content in the soil is very high, the neonics will remain in the soil a longer time. If it's sandy soil, it's going to run out. It's going to run off. So there's no average answer, and there's certainly not enough data. And so bedding plants, this is a huge thing going on right now in Minnesota about nursery plants. How long is it in there? It can be in there anywhere from several weeks to a year, depending on how much was applied, how much organic content is matter is in the soil, how big the plant was, and you know what the original dose was. So this is all information we need to start paying attention to closely and trying to get more data from. And what is my personal recommendation? Um, if there are nurseries that are selling 
flowering plants that you know that bees like, I would try to f purchase those particular plants at a nursery that's not pre-treating their plants with a neonicotinoid as a precaution. And then I would continue to ask the nurseries where they're getting their plants, are they pre-treated, um, doesn't have to be all their plants, just the ones that are what I would call bee friendly. So already in Minnesota, there's several big nurseries, Bachmann's, Gertens, that are moving toward having neonic free flowering plants, pollinator friendly plants. I think this will be a movement nationwide. Whoa, where am I? Commercial bumblebees. Um, play a role in honeybee die-off. Um, I think it kind of went the other way. We do know now that um, honeybees and bumblebees, well, that bumblebees have some honeybee viruses, but I don't know the extent of how they affect the life of the bumblebees, if they're, how pathogenic they really are. I know commercial bumblebees ha have a kind of, excuse me, nosema, but that nosema is very different. It's a different species from the one that infects honeybees. So we need to be another area of research. We need to be paying attention to the movement of pathogens between honeybees and native bees and back. Uh, it's an area of active research, and I don't know if I answered that very well. But Okay, Don says, half-life of neonics varies from 197 to over 1,500 de days depending on soil density, and I would say, and also depending on the concentration that was applied to the plant or to the soil. <laughs> Thank you, Melville. I guess that's for everybody. And Susan Kegley, who uh, is part of the, I'm going to get the name wrong, but Pesticide Action Network, I believe, out of California, has done a lot of sampling on nursery plants. That's where our best data is, in fact, and they're going to be doing more. So stay tuned. Thank you. I appreciate that. There we go. Pesticide Research Institute. Got it. So if anyone else has any questions, I'd encourage you to put them in the Q&A box. Uh, Rosa, I also wanted to ask you if you could bring in the link um, to the recorded webinar and put it on top there. I I'm not sure what happened to it. Um, the, re the recorded webinar will be available probably, there we go, by tomorrow. Um, looks like the Q&A is starting to slow down, Marla. Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go, sorry. <laughs> oh, wait, we have... <laughs> Peggy wants to know, how did you fall in love with bees? Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great I don't question. know how... <laughs> I don't I read a book and then went to work for a commercial beekeeper because I had to see it to believe it. I'm a kind of a hands-on person and I wanted to see beehives. So once I got my face and hands in a beehive, that was it. <laughs> Hooked. We have a question from Don. Oh, you know, the DC meeting agenda, can the public participate? I don't have a specific agenda, and I know the public cannot participate at this point, except to uh, really be in contact with your state, uh, your, your U.S. representatives and senators, your House and Senate members from your state. So um, I don't know what the agenda is. I'm optimistic. Mm. Melville enjoyed your TED talk. Thank you.
All right, it looks like we're slowing down here. Well, I wanted to thank all of the participants. Oh, we have another one coming in. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Have I seen much pollen hoarding in brood combs? Any ideas why? Um, well, you know what? Our, it's been freezing here in Minnesota, and we're just starting to get our first pollen from maple and maybe a little bit of oak and some Siberian squill flowers in town. So haven't seen any pollen hoarding here. I imagine you're talking about in California. Um, and I don't know why you know it's a genetic trait of bees but it sounds like there's a lot of pollen and I think I'm gonna to have to email you separately to talk more about that sorry I don't have an answer for you right now would I be interested in receiving pollen samples from Ohio um, thanks Pam but no because I don't know what plants are in Ohio and you need the pollen from the plant mounted on a slide so that when I get pollen from the bees I could I, I can use the plant pollen as a reference so it's very time-consuming and um, we're not ready to go nationwide on this yet you should push your researchers at Ohio State uh, to do their own reference library or your hobby group hobby beekeeping group would be great Chris wants to know if you do any speaking tours, and Peggy would like to know if you're going to be speaking in the New York City area. <laughs> I do do a lot of tours. Um, I've had to decline a lot in the last year or, or for the time being because of all the legislative efforts that are going on right now around getting a new bee lab. I need to be in town if I need to go testify at our legislature. So um, I think I do have a New Hampshire, possibly New York talk coming on, coming up maybe next March. I can't remember. <laughs> Sometime. All right. Any more questions from the audience? Well, it's we're just before two o'clock. Um, looks like we can probably wind things up. We've got a bunch of thank yous coming in. I think people um, thank many, many thanks to Marla on behalf of everyone for her fascinating talk and for addressing thanks. so many questions. A very, very long list of questions. Many thanks to the to the audience members. Um, you can always tell it was a good talk when the, the questions were so great. Um, so, uh, and once again, please let your colleagues know that the recorded webinar will be available on the NCRCRD website. And uh, that's it. I'd like to bring this to a close and thank you all for participating today. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.